Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maureen Wilson, um, proud Ward 1 Hamilton City Councillor. An honour to serve you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, before we begin uh, getting into the meeting and its purpose, I'm going to read out a land acknowledgement. The City of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie Neutral, Huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. So uh, welcome one and all. Um, this uh, evening is the Bredalbane or Bredalbane um, uh, Bicycle Boulevard pilot project. Um, I have an agenda, we have an agenda, it's before you uh, right now. It's the, the roadmap. I'm going to introduce who is joining us uh, from the, the staff end of things, and then we'll get right into it. Uh, you're in um, good hands and uh, lucky hands because I will not be speaking all that much tonight. As someone reminded me, every minute I speak is uh, one uh, less minute for the public. Uh, joining us tonight from the City of Hamilton's Sustainable Transportation Division is Peter Topolovic, Program Manager, and Trevor Jenkins. Welcome. From the City's Transportation Operations Maintenance Division within Public Works is Mike Fields, who is the Acting Director, Mushfiq Rahman, the Senior Project Manager of Transportation Engineering, and Becker Fahad, the Project Manager of Pedestrian and Cycling Engineering. Um, also joining us from the IBI group is Zibi Petch. She is the Manager of Active Transportation. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'll be walking you through the proposed changes along Brettlebane. Uh, before we open it up to questions, uh, our project limits for this study include Brettlebane, a little section of Jones, as well as Woodbine between King Street uh, and York Boulevard. These are primarily low speed, low volume streets, but we feel that there's an opportunity through some design changes to enhance this area for people walking and cycling while supporting community objectives. Uh, from a cycling perspective, this is an important link as cyclists regularly use this corridor to connect to and from the York or King Street cycling facilities. And particularly since the eastbound facilities along King end at Brettlebane, many cyclists use Brettlebane to connect to Hunt or Baker or even Sunset to continue further east. So why are we proposing a bicycle boulevard along this corridor? This is really in response to concerns from residents about speeding and cut through traffic along Brettlebane. We see an opportunity to tie together improvements aimed at managing vehicular speed and volume. This will also help us create an attractive all ages and ability cycling route. And I'll note that bicycle boulevards are also identified as part of the city's COVID-19 recovery mobility plan. So our project objectives include expanding the citywide cycling network with connections to existing east-west cycling facilities on King and York, enhancing corridor safety and livability by calming vehicular traffic uh, volumes and speeds, as well as incorporating beautification, and using a pilot project approach with rapid implementation to grow our understanding of bicycle boulevards and how they work in Hamilton, and to test new design elements. So what exactly are bicycle boulevards? These are not the same as other forms of cycling infrastructure you may have seen around the cities, such as bike lanes. Uh, they do not provide dedicated space for cyclists. Instead, vehicle speeds and volumes are controlled to help create a safe and welcoming street for both pedestrians and cyclists, with cyclists sharing the road with vehicles. These are slow speed, low volume streets that incorporate various treatments depending on operating conditions. You may have also heard these referred to as slow streets or neighborhood greenways in other cities. So I mentioned the range of treatments that may be considered along a bicycle boulevard. 
typically they will always include the first two levels here, signage and pavement markings. These help guide users along the corridor, consisting of wayfinding, directional markers, and bike route signs. And depending on the specific conditions within each block, other elements, including intersection treatments and speed management or traffic diversion may also be considered. These images should give you a better sense of how bicycle boulevard boulevards look and feel. You'll see the use of wayfinding directional markers, signage, and examples of traffic diversion, which help to prevent cut through traffic. So let's walk through the proposed changes along this corridor to give you more detail on how these treatments are proposed to be specifically applied. So these images illustrate examples of the types of treatments being proposed through this project. The top left shows directional wayfinding markings that help guide cyclists along a corridor. Then we have signage that identifies the route as a bicycle boulevard. We also are proposing some curb extensions that help to narrow the road typically around intersections to reduce and control vehicle speeds. At the bottom right, we see an example of what we call a modified or realigned intersection. These are used at T intersections and they help slow vehicles through the intersection and enhance pedestrian safety. Then we see traffic circles, which can be used to enhance the public realm, but also help to slow turning vehicles through intersections. And finally, directional diverters, which are applied to restrict vehicular movements in a particular direction while maintaining access for pedestrians and cyclists. And these are generally used to help discourage cut through traffic. So this project is proposed to be implemented as a pilot project with an opportunity to test the design and adapt it over time. Materials may vary from simple, quickly installed materials to more robust long-term materials giving an opportunity to test performance. And an important element of bicycle boulevards are greening and public realm enhancements, including plantings and decorative elements that would likely be added over time. So what does this look like for a typical section of Brettlebane? Outside of intersections, the corridor will remain much as it is today. Currently there's parking on one side with two-way vehicular traffic, and this will remain exactly the same along most of the corridor just with the addition of the pavement markings and signage for cyclists. Parking is generally not proposed to be removed mid-block. So now we'll walk through the various improvements with this plan view and you'll be able to get a better sense of some of those intersection specific treatments. So to orient you as I work my way north along the corridor, here you'll see King Street to the left of the screen uh, and we're looking north at the right of the screen. So we're looking at the most southerly block of Brettlebane, um, starting from King Street and moving our way north. So the first intervention you'll see that we're proposing is a curb extension right at the entrance to the Cathedral Road, and that will help to control turning vehicle speeds. Then at Hunt Street, you'll see that we are proposing a traffic diverter that will restrict the southbound movement for vehicles. Part of the reason that we're considering this treatment along the bike boulevard is that we suspect many vehicles are using Hunt and Brettlebane to avoid the King and Dundurn intersection. So introducing this feature will help to reduce vehicle cut through traffic along Hunt, Baker and Brettlebane. Just to show you what that will look like. Um, so obviously we have many residents, I'm sure you're aware, this section of road is currently no entry during afternoon weekday peak periods. And so that would become a permanent restriction. Although obviously pedestrians and cyclists would still be permitted to make that movement. So the current left turn through and right turn movements that you see here would not be possible by, by vehicles. And this is really an effort to discourage cut through traffic. With this change, we would lose about one parking space along this block uh, for the length of the diverter, but we do have some parking utilization counts that suggest relatively low usage for this block. Moving north along Brettlebane, in addition to the pavement markings and signage that we show throughout, that's the green feature you see, we are proposing to add some speed management features uh, right at the Baker Street intersection, uh, including uh, curb extensions or chokers designed to narrow the traffic lane and reduce speeds. Uh, because these features are being proposed uh, directly at the intersection where parking is not permitted, there is no anticipated impact to parking supply from these features. We're also proposing a few curb extensions on the east side of the street, again, to control the speed of turning traffic. Moving north along Brettlebane um, to Lockern and Tom, 
in addition to pavement markings and signage, we're proposing to add a traffic circle at the intersection of Locker, so you can see an example here, and a realigned modified intersection uh, at Tom Street. Both of these elements will help to slow vehicles through the intersection without impacting parking supply. And finally, our last section of the corridor, um, this is where we have our little jog along Jones uh, and down Woodbine. In addition to the pavement markings and signage, again, we're just proposing a curb extension right at the intersection of Jones and Brettleton. And I will note that there are future improvements planned to the intersection of York and Woodbine through a separate project along York Boulevard. And with that, I will turn it back to Trevor to talk about project timelines and next steps. So thank you, Zibi. Um, so in terms of where we are right now with this project, we are in what we call the preliminary design stage. Um, so this is where we have the general idea of what we'd like to be able to do, but we wanna be able to meet with you, the residents and uh, future users um, to answer your questions, um, get your feedback and incorporate it into the design. Uh, moving forward, what we would be looking towards is doing more detailed design uh, throughout 2021 and looking towards launching this pilot uh, in 2022. Um, as noted on the screen, the design concept is subject to refinement through consultation, further analysis and detailed design, uh, which is why we wanna get your feedback and comments uh, to make sure we can understand what the community's views are. Um, so as I mentioned, we do wanna hear from you. Um, so at the bottom there, we have set up a comment form where you can submit your feedback. Um, it's available at hamilton.ca slash new lanes. Uh, so this is the page where all the information on um, current uh, cycling projects in the city are available. Um, you can also submit your comments directly to us via email at sustainable.mobility at hamilton.ca. Um, so I've received a number of comments from folks already that I believe I responded to almost everyone as of noon today. Um, so please share your comments and we like that for feedback. Um, we also ask that you submit your comments by Friday, October 8th, which is just a little bit over from two weeks from now. Um, after October 8th, we'll review all the comments um, and we'll take the input and start to refine the design. Um, from then, there, we'll move into detailed design um, and finalizing design throughout the rest of 2021 and the early 22. Um, and then after that, we'll be moving towards that pilot implementation next year, um, as well as doing ongoing monitoring and adaptation over time. Thanks, Trevor. Yep. Uh, I'll start with our first question from Cameron. Is this meant to replace the Dundurn bike lanes? Um, so I can start and maybe Zibi can join, chime in afterwards. Um, so this project isn't intended to replace the vendor and bike lanes, it's more meant to complement it. Um, so as part of the last cycling master plan uh, review and update, Brettlebane was identified as an important link um, for connecting King and York, um, as well as to um, kind of head and hunt in the crossings um, that are popular there. Um, so this is really more meant to provide a opportunity to create an all ages and abilities uh, cycling link. Uh, Part of the reason with that is, as you probably are aware, as you're going from King up to York, there is a bit of a climb up the hill um, and Dundurn is a busier street. So this is more meant to provide that opportunity for a, a lower connection, more comfortable uh, street where cyclists can be comfortable. Um, Zibi, I'm not sure if there's anything else you wanna add into there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a good summary. I'll just quickly say, obviously the city is continuing to try to expand their network of all ages mm -hmm. and ability cycling facilities. So we know that with a corridor like Dundurn, that's higher speed, higher volume. Um, it would take more like a protected bike lane um, to fit that category. Whereas with Brettlebane, knowing what we can do in terms of controlling speeds and volume along this corridor, we see that as a really great um, AAA cycling facility in the future. Thank you. From Teresa, um, how will parking along the proposed route be impacted? Um, so from our analysis and preliminary design, the only loss of parking we expect is one parking spot between Hunt and King Street uh, for the traffic diverter. Um, everywhere else, we're just formalizing, um, we're not losing any legal parking spots. Um, so all the parking that's available today, um, either on Brettle Bain or the side seats will remain there. Thank you. Great. From Christine, she apologizes if she missed it, but can you still turn on to Brettle Bain from King Street and drive all the way to the end. So if you came on to King, could you drive up northbound? Yep, Zibi, can I just get you to go back to that slide? Oh, perfect. Yep, so the traffic diverter, so yep. What you're describing, Christine, about turning from King on to Brettle Bain, yep, you can still make that movement. 
it would just be the other direction. So you couldn't come, you know, from York Boulevard down Bridal Bank to King. That would be closed off um, at Hunt Street. Um, really meant to uh, kind of deter people who are cutting through to avoid that uh, Dundurn and King intersection. Um, but traveling from King Street towards York Boulevard in that direction will still be fully permitted. From James, can the prohibition of traffic onto King from Bridal Bank be reconsidered? Uh, so this is an interesting question. Um, so one of the things we found with some of our early conversations was that there was a large amount of cut through traffic coming from uh, folks who are trying to avoid that Dundurn and King intersection, uh, particularly because, um, you know, in non-COVID times, it does tend to get backed up. Uh, we have compared some pre-COVID traffic counts to uh, post-COVID traffic counts, and it looks like there has been a drop of about 250 vehicles um, per day kind of taking that direction. So it does seem that there is, there is cut through traffic uh, coming through. Um, we, we think this traffic diverter offers an interesting opportunity to be able to test to see if um, that reduction is still happening. Um, as you're probably aware, there is that peak period restriction already in place there. Um, however, it doesn't seem to be, not everyone's respecting it as they should, uh, which is a challenge. Um, so, you know, there has been concerns, there have been comments from the community before, um, which is why we're trying to look towards a more permanent solution or a more test out a more permanent solution there, uh, just to see how it, how it would work out. Is there any risk to removing more on-street parking than was discussed today? Parking is already tight on, Tom's, on Tom and Jones and his support for the project depends on whether the current on-street parking is maintained. Um, so I can start and then maybe Zibby, if you want to join me or anyone else. Um, from our analysis right now, we did do parking surveys and we fully recognize that uh, parking is at a very much of a premium in this neighborhood. Uh, many of your, re of your residents and local community households don't have access to a driveway. So, you know, on-street parking is a necessity, um, which is why we tried to limit any sort of extensions or uh, uh, features to avoid any impacts. Uh, we don't foresee any additional impacts coming through. Um, if there was a, a change, then we would uh, probably come back. But as of right now, everything that we're proposing can be done within uh, the space where parking is not legally allowed today. How will this impact snow removal? Uh, it won't impact snow removal. We will uh, make any adjustments to the snow removal program based on what uh, elements we would construct on, uh, on Brattlebane. Is there potential to better improve the Bredalbane and Jones intersection? So, uh, and this one's a bit of an interesting one. I'll start and Zibby, you can add in. Um, because it is that bit of an offset, it does operate as two separate intersections. So it, we try to avoid trying to combine that into one operation just because you wouldn't have sight lines available for the different opposing traffic. Uh, we are looking towards the improvement of having that tighter turning radii there um, in order to, uh, in order to slow down some of those vehicles uh, coming down. Um, Zibi, maybe do you have any additional comments there? No, I mean, I'd be interested um, for whoever provided that comment, if you wanna provide any you know, suggestions or comments about some of the challenges that you are experiencing at that location. It's something we could always take back and give a little bit of thought to. Um, we, have, we did think about things like having a similar realigned or modified intersection of this location, but with the, the driveway placements across from the intersection, it's a little bit tricky, um, but certainly would be interested to hear any community suggestions or input. Thanks, Sibby. From Mark, is there plans for westbound to York from Woodbind? Yep, um, so I'll start this question then hand it over to Peter Topolovic uh, to add any additional comments. So. From my understanding of the question, you're asking if from the westbound cyclists on York to be able to access Woodbine. Uh, so in the interim, the answer would be that uh, that cyclist would have to turn left at Dundurn and enter through Jones. Um, there is a longer term project, as I think you mentioned, Zibi has highlighted there, um, to do improvements there to actually provide that direct connection. Uh, I'm not sure if Peter wants to talk a bit more about that uh, York and Dundurn project. Thanks, Trevor. Um, so this uh, project uh, at York and Dundurn is planned for future works uh, in the mid 2025 uh, range, and um, we would come back for more public consultation on on this on this one and work with uh, 
Mike Fields group as well, uh, as uh, there's a potential to uh, realign the intersection and perhaps provide direct access to Woodline um, from York and Dundurn. Uh, and there have been some planning exercises that have happened previously uh, that uh, sort of show the different ways we can do that, but I think uh, more work will have to happen on the intersection. I don't know if Mike wants to add to that, but uh, it's certainly on the table and we will be coming back. Uh, there's, there's no feasibility study for that yet. Uh, and, and that road works itself have not yet been planned, but the idea would be that there's lots of potential for uh, making changes to that intersection in, in the, what I would call the near future. Will this include road remediations? Thanks, not, not at this moment. Do we have plans for directly associated with this project to do any resurfacing, that sort of thing? Um, but I know the councillor might uh, might have other plans in the future. Why are you doing all this when this route works fine for bikes and cars? Um, so I can start that question. Um, so the transportation master plan set out a vision for how we're going to um, keep moving into the future, looking towards 2031 and beyond. Um, and similarly, the official plan set a plan for growth. And one thing both of them found is that we really need to start finding other ways to help uh, people move, um, be able to get around in order to have a really a transportation system that works for everyone um, and to support the growth. Um, as you're probably familiar with, the uh, city did declare a climate emergency, um, which you know does support the push or the move towards uh, really trying to create opportunities for others to get around. Um, and we really see this as a great connecting link uh, because really Breadalbane is a, a very important link between King and May or King and York, um, you know, providing good access over to the King Street bike lanes to get to McMaster and to downtown and the communities in between. Um, Hand it over to maybe Peter if you want to add in some additional comments about. I just wanted to add to um, that uh, council has unanimously supported principles of Vision Zero, which uh, uh, require us to uh, look out for the best interests of vulnerable road users, which are pedestrians and cyclists as well. So this project is in alignment with the with the goals and objectives of uh, the Vision Zero commitment. I was also going to say that this adds to creating a very balanced street as well. So without compromising um, the on-street parking and, and allowing um, a same similar throughput of, for local cars, people who do live in the neighborhood, we also increase the uh, sort of the capacity for uh, pedestrians and cyclists to, to use this as, a, as a, a more preferred route and a safer route. So uh, this bringing in a really complete streets look and focus to, to the street and the area. Thank you. It's Maureen Wilson, Councillor. Um, all of those comments, uh, in addition to, um, we know that 22% of Ward 1 residents do not have a, a car. They do not own a car. And so as a councillor, I'm also accountable uh, to those residents, but also the policies that the city has put out. And part of that is equity, um, making sure that we share our most expensive and largest public asset, and that's our streets. Um, secondly, the city has declared a climate emergency, and we know um, the private automobile is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gases. Um, so if we're going to be encouraging uh, people to take responsibility, I think it's the onus is on us as a city to ensure that we have safe options uh, for you if, if you want to um, uh, you know, switch up, uh, not use a, a cycle all the time or not walk all the time, but at least provide um, safer options. Um, and the third um, piece is that one of the, the issues that the Ward 1 office deals with probably um, most frequently are concerns from all residents about the safety of their streets. Um, a lot of uh, concerns about fast moving traffic, uh, rat running, uh, it's another way to say, uh, people who are using your street through your neighborhood uh, on their commute somewhere else. Um, and so they don't really take that much ownership of your safety. Um, and so if we want to really address those concerns, um, it means we have to fundamentally look at sometimes the design of our streets. So we discourage that kind of um, unsafe behavior. So for all those reasons and the eloquent ones that the staff members set out, 
that's why we're we're pursuing this. Are they going to make Woodbine one way for cars? So as part of this proposal, no, we intend to keep Woodbine as a two-way street for vehicles. Um, if there are feedback or comments about that, we'd be interested to hear about them. Um, but as pr proposed here, there would just be some additional signage and uh, pavement markings for cyclists. What is the duration of the pilot? What are the metrics of success? success. Yep. Um, so we have developed a kind of what we call the evaluation framework uh, for monitoring the success of this, uh, which will include some of the data we've already collected around traffic volumes, uh, speeds, and complaints along, along the community. Um, we also, for a pilot like this, we use technically launch, typically launch a, a community survey before, um, partway through, then like, you know, before this it goes in, six months in, a year, and then two years after, uh, to get the community's input and understanding, uh, to you know, get their views and assess them on different areas, um, to you know, for users as well as uh, residents and property owners uh, to understand their uh, their opinions and views, um, as well as you know, if there were. Uh, changes we had to make throughout the process, um, making sure we keep track of those and understand uh, those as well. Could the stop sign signs be converted to yield signs? Cyclists already race through the signs at Lock Hearn every day. So how how will the, this um, road also, how will the cyclists yield to the pedestrians and, and the rest of the folks and trying to get through on the street? Um, so maybe I can start, and maybe Mike other if we can uh, speak in about converting stop white signs to yield signs first. Sure, yeah. Uh, our, our preference is to use uh, stop controls for intersections and avoid using uh, yield signs. Uh, we only try to use or use yield signs in certain circumstances. Um, in intersections like this, we, we wouldn't depart from uh, using all-way or uh, stop controls. Um, I, I do believe this is where the traffic circle is. At uh, this is oh. Lockhearn and and. Uh, oh, sorry. Yep. In, in that case, they would become yield signs. I think the stop signs are showing the existing ones uh, that are there today. Sorry about that. Kara. Um, She's concerned that the bikes don't stop at stop signs, but she would also like to know about enforcement and um, <laughs> and when Jones will be repaved. Separate question, but uh, how is enforcement used in these situations, and why hasn't that been? Why is that not the successful way to deal with these situations? In, in terms of enforcement of uh, cyclists or vehicles stopping oh. at stop signs, basically. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, that's part of uh, Hamilton Police Services um, kind of role. So as a city, uh, we will ask them to help uh, enforce certain areas of the city upon request that uh, we we think that there needs to be additional uh, enforcement. Um, but otherwise, they they kind of look at and plan out their enforcement activities across the city. Uh, bicycles are uh, are considered vehicles under the Highway Traffic Act and are uh, required to follow all traffic laws uh, that vehicles are required to follow as well. Yeah, um, I will only kind of add into that as some of these intersection modifications we're proposing, uh, while they will help to sp uh, slow down automobile traffic. They do also require cyclists to be able to respond. You know, right now it is, for lack of a better term, a straight shoot um, down, but this will require them to be able to, you know, be more alert, be able to navigate around some of these changes as well. Um, so it's not just automobiles that we're hoping to manage, but also the cyclists uh, to be, um, to help, you know, build in that natural enforcement. This is from Christine, who um, noted that uh, the people participating tonight, that 51% of the people used bikes. Um, and she's wondering why that makes it a priority for a bike lane, though we've talked about this isn't a bike lane. Uh, bike lanes are dedicated. This is not a dedicated bike lane. When she's concerned, what, if we already have one, one on Dundurn and along the water, shouldn't the focus be on something else other than bike lanes right now? And Maureen, maybe this is for you. Um, shouldn't the the focus be on dealing with crime in the neighborhood. Uh, thank you. Um, well, the more people actually that we have on our streets, um, 
that are walking and cycling and can see your seats, streets, we know it, it does have a, an impact on, on crime. Um, any eyes on the street make a, make a difference. But th that aside, uh, for all the reasons that have been previously articulated, um, we, we have a, a climate emergency. Um, we need to be able to provide as a city, it's our responsibility to provide safe options. Um, and also for the reason uh, that we are continuously receiving calls from residents worried about the safety of their, their children, their elderly parents or themselves in, in getting around the city and crossing the street. Um, the traffic is just moving too quickly. Um, uh, and this is building on previous commitments that, that have been made. Um, in, in addition, we know that um, more people want um, a choice in how they move. Um, economically, uh, cars cost a lot of money um, and people would like to, to pursue other options, whether it be transit or walking or, or cycling for, for a whole bunch of reasons, economic, environmental, social and health. Um, all cities, not just Hamilton, but I can only speak for Hamilton. Uh, this, is, this is the reason we are pursuing this. Uh, Chris is asking, why is this not going along Hunt to head up to Strathcona uh, and, and thereby slowing traffic in front of the school and the park and the seniors home? Um, and he's also worried about the steep hill. So why are you not going down Hunt and over to head as currently is quasi marked? Um, well, I think that I'm assuming you mean, Chris, that um, like in terms of the, the bicycle boulevard portion of, of this and why we're not using Hunt, I think that we're looking at both Hunt and also uh, a few other intersections here to see how, we'll, how, how we can better bring people uh, who are coming off, off of Lock Street and, and through the bicycle boulevard uh, nearer to the downtown and bring them through uh, at places like Hunt, which is marked already, but um, others as well. Uh, like Lamoureux. And so that's not part of this project, but we are looking at that as well in terms of how people are crossing uh, Dundurn, which I think is what you're referring to, I guess, is bringing people through and across Dundurn. Just reflect, uh, echo what Pete said there. I think, you know, we're not just looking at this. There's other, other ideas in the way, um, but this is the, the priority for our project uh, as described today. Uh, Julie is concerned about the folks that live on Hunt that park in behind their homes and about the, the fellow who has the garage on there, um, that they that access for them will be choked off and that they won't be able to access their um, the rear of their properties. Is there any solutions for those folks or is that something that you'll take into consideration? Um, so we have reached out to some of the destinations there, including the cathedral as well as the, uh, the garage owner there uh, to have a discussion, understand uh, you know, their needs and locations there. Um, we, we do agree that it is a challenge with that short alleyway there. And if there are specific comments or concerns, we'd like, uh, that, that's part of what today is and the comments that we're trying to get uh, to understand concerns, uh, whether, you know, we might move that traffic diverter down or make other adjustments to that area. Um, but we are cognizant of, that, uh, of the access there. And um, we, would, we would like to, you know, hear the feedback and comments if people are actively using their rear alleyways or if they are using on-street parking to get a um, to make adjustments and refinements to the plan. Woodbine is too small for bike lanes, cars and parking. So how will that work in that section? Um, so Zibi, if you maybe want to go to the typical cross sections. Um, so we're not proposing to add bike lanes onto Woodbine. Um, it would look very similar to what it does today. Uh, whereas there's the parking on the one side um, and the one brighter, uh, wider lane. Uh, what we'd only be adding is pavement markings for cyclists. Um, from looking at the road, there is space for a car and a cyclist to pass each other. Um, part of it is, you know, it is a narrower road and that does create what we call passive uh, friction. So, um, you know, it is a narrow road so people feel more comfortable, tend to go more slowly. Um, so that's part of the intent. Um, we also don't expect this to be a bike boulevard that carries, you know, millions of cyclists a day. I would carry a moderate volume. So there would be that uh, good balance to provide the connections and the connectivity, um, but also avoid, uh, you know, a, a lot of the conflicts that uh, that can happen. 
Chris is asking, is there potential to allow flow of walkers and cyclists, but cut off automobile, automobile traffic completely like, <clears throat> like Shaw in Toronto? Yep, um, I can start and maybe Zibi can add in. I know you've worked more with some projects in the city of Toronto. Uh, our traffic diverter, uh, the Shaw Street example, for instance, is they closed off the street completely at the intersection. Um, in our case, we're only looking at closing it for that one-way direction to still provide local residential access. Uh, for instance, at Hunter, at Hunt and uh, Brettlebane. Um, so it's partially similar to Shaw Street. Um, as you know, some of the comments we received today, we are cognizant that uh, residents still need to be able to access their home and doing that directly from some of the other streets uh, may not be desirable. Have you considered that the other changes will alter the amount of cut through traffic? I don't quite understand that. I might be reading it incorrectly. Can yeah. you see it, Trevor? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. I think the comment might be providing that uh, traffic diverter will mean that, you know, some folks who come down Brettlebane to get to King will now end up on Hunt. Um, I think it is fair that there might be a bit of an education period, um, but we can put up signage to enforce the fact that, you know, you can't do that cut through anymore as part of the project. Uh, to really emphasize that beforehand uh, to get those vehicles off of Brettlebane in the side streets um, and reduce those volumes as is intended. How much money is allocated for this project? Uh, so we do have some funding through the existing bike boulevard uh, budget for the city uh, to do the design and implementation. Um, it's already part of our normal budgeting process, so uh, there will be no impact. It's just similar to the other cycling projects we do across the city. Could snow clearing be brought to cycling infrastructure standards occurring more quickly? Will the diverter receive snow clearing despite its tight width? I can answer that question. And uh, um, bike, bike lanes are required to uh, be uh, cleared the same way as driving lanes. And um, that is something that we're working on uh, making sure that that occurs. Uh, with that considered, the uh, diverter uh, or in between the sidewalk and the diverter would be clean to that same uh, level of service as well. Thanks. All right, from Ed, on slide 20, Zibby, says people do park in front of Tom Street Park. Is this in fact an illegal parking area? Uh, yes, so under the city's bylaw, there's no parking allowed on street in front of parks. Um, so this is somewhere where parking and the bylaw enforcement can, uh, can ticket a vehicle for being parked there. Can there be a consideration for speed humps to be added along Verdal Bain, especially near Tom Park? You may want to show them what you're trying to, to do at Tom as well. Yeah. So as part of our other improvements at Tom Park, we are looking towards what's called a realigned or modified intersection. Um, so shown in the bottom right corner, when the curbs would come out, um, it has benefits to pedestrians because it would shorten the crossing distance if you're crossing Brettlebane, um, as well as it would slow down. Um, we did do some speed studies, but there weren't uh, significant speeding found. However, we can take that comment back and look at it a bit further um, if, um, you know, based off that comment, if there are concerns about speeding in that area. Thanks. Okay. Question here. Um, concern about wood buying, that the street is not very wide, especially on us with on-street parking, is there consideration of turning the bike boulevard to the right on Jones and then off to Dundurn rather than taking it up Woodbine? The current cross. Uh, so that is a good piece of feedback and we can uh, look into it. I think the reason we are interested in that Woodbine connection is, um, I think as Peter mentioned before, there is looking towards a project in that area that would provide better connectivity um, you know, that little stretch of Dundurn from Jones to, to York is not the most comfortable. It does have higher volumes of traffic. Um, so it is a, not, not an ideal place if we are looking towards getting more, um, creating that all ages and ability cycling network uh, for folks to get more comfortable cycling. Um, you know, York is a bit more buffered with the bike lanes there, uh, but the Dundurn that stretch is a bit, uh, bit narrower and may not be as comfortable for everyone who cycles. Zibi, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that comment or? Sure. I mean, I can just chime in that yeah. 
um, I think we've we've really emphasized that the uh, it, we're not trying to provide separate space for cycling. So vehicles and cyclists would be sharing that space. And so we would probably envision, you know, if it's a narrow section, it would be single file operations. But through our traffic coming interventions, we're trying to create a, a street where bikes and vehicles would be traveling at roughly the same speed anyway. So um, that will help with some of that sort of negotiating and sharing of space. All right, I think we're getting into comments now, um, which all the comments will be recorded. So your our speed limit's going to drop. Yep. Um, so I can start the question then and maybe I'll hand it over to Mike Field. Um, so as part of the city's vision zero, there is a neighborhood speed reduction pilot or program underway. And I believe Strathcona is slated for 2022. So maybe I'll hand it to Mike to speak a bit more about that. Part of the neighborhood speed reduction program is that all neighborhoods across the city, uh, the speed limits are being lowered to uh, to 40 kilometers an hour and the 30 kilometers an hour within uh, within school zones. So this neighborhood is earmarked for that. And uh, as as Trevor kind of noted, um, that happening within uh, 2022 next year. And is there a possibility of having speed bumps on the street for calming purposes? Um, so I can start maybe hand it over to Mike if he has any additional comments. Uh, we can look into that. Um, I think one of the concerns is making sure they're the right size so we don't impact street parking um, at all or lost spaces on streets. But um, uh, it's something we can look into based off it has come up in a couple of comments so we can look into that. Okay, Monica is asking with bump outs, how many parking spot spots will be lost? Um, so the plan with the bump outs is they would already only be limited to the space that's it's not legal to park in already. Um, so there'd be no loss of parking in that section. The only place we anticipate a loss parking spot would be um, where the traffic diver diverter is south of Hunt, uh, where we anticipate one loss parking spot, um, but everywhere else, all legal parking will remain. How long is this pilot proposed and intended to run for? Uh, he yep. feels that there's lots of pilots that um, are too short or miss seasonal changes? Yep. Uh, so we'd intend to cover at least uh, two of the major cycling seasons. Um, and as I mentioned, as part of the monitoring, doing kind of follow up or survey beforehand, uh, six months after, a year after, and two years after um, to understand changes and things like that uh, to try to get more of a full set of data. Um, so that's what we're looking at towards for the, the pilot program. Um, and as I mentioned, kind of using that mix of permanent and flexible materials. All right, I guess people, there are people parking illegally now and, and they're concerned that they won't be able to continue parking illegally. Uh, again, we'll take that into consideration um, though you're parking legally. Would a local traffic only sign be included if you're looking at a, uh, a, a greenway in order to uh, reduce, again, let folks know this, this isn't a place to try to cut through? Yep, I can start um, kind of the first portion, maybe hand it over to Mike to talk about the effectiveness of the local traffic only. Uh, probably what we would do here instead of having a local traffic is just signs that say no access to King Street via Brettlebane or something like that, just to really drive home that point. Um, I'm not sure if Mike can speak to the effectiveness of local traffic only signs in other places or his experience with them. Uh, we, we don't uh, use that signage except for uh, road closures, temporary road closures, that sort of thing. And I think your comment about uh, the signs indicating no through traffic are more effective. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening. Um, really appreciate your excellent questions, great attendance. And as Stephanie noted, um, please do not hesitate to send along your comments, your concerns, any additional information uh, that you, you think would um, uh, help us uh, moving forward. Um, I think Trevor gave a, gave a date of October the 8th. Um, and if for some reason uh, you're not able to find those emails, you can always email us at ward1 at hamilton.ca and we'll ensure that the questions, comments, concerns are answered and, and directed accordingly. So thank you all very, very much. And please, again, if your neighbors missed 
the session, uh, they'll be able to catch it on YouTube. Thank you to staff for joining us uh, and for your service this evening. Be safe, everyone.